Hello, this is Jay Greenstein, your grumpy old writing coach, back again to annoy you. And tonight, I am a little grumpy, because up till now, I've been talking about overview, things that we all screw up when we turn to writing, things that had somebody mentioned it in our schooling would never have gone wrong. But I have not gone into detail because I'm not a writing teacher and I make no pretension of being an expert at writing. I've just made every mistake that you can possibly make. So I'm the guy that says, hey, don't do that. It certainly didn't work for me. And it's not going to work for you. But I've raised some, um, some points that I feel need explanation. And in this final session, I am going to, um, to bring them up and to discuss them a little bit. And the first thing that I want to talk about are motivation response units. They are the heart of making fiction readable, of involving the reader to the point where they feel it is happening to them. And if we don't get that right, we don't get anything right. So that's what I'm going to go into. And this is probably the last one. I've run out of dolls to put. Elmo's like my last, last one that I have for my grandchildren that I can uh, sit here to, to kind of cheer me on. So let's get into it. These are just a few of the covers that I happen to like. But let's turn them off and go to Motivation Response Unit. I'm sure you can't read this. I will read it for you. Um, they're mostly to keep me remembering. Motivation Reaction Units. This is what we do. This is how we, as human beings, live our life. And an unending chain from the time we wake up to the time we sleep, it goes like this. Number one, motivation. Something worthy of our protagonist's attention. Could be a knock on the door. Could be the teapot whistling. Could be a knife being thrown at our head. Or someone sneaking through the window. Or the sight of someone we love. It will make us take action. And if it won't, cut it out of your story. It serves no purpose. The trick you have to remember, if you can say it in fewer words and keep your voice, then you say it in fewer, fewer words. Because it will read faster. And if it reads faster, it has more impact. That is something that I see all the time. Verbose, verbose, verbose. Let me tell you about everything that's in the room that your protagonist is ignoring. The protagonist is the key. If it matters to the protagonist, it matters to the reader. If it matters to you, who cares? You're not in the story. And using first person personal pronouns and pretending to be the protagonist who wants to experience that stuff changes nothing. You're not in the story and you live at a different time and place from where the story took place. So if we're with you, it can't be real. So first thing, motivation. Something is worthy of our protagonist's attention. Two, the instinctive response. Someone throws something at us, we duck. Someone says something that shocks us, we, okay? That isn't always there. Something may happen and we will respond to it without that instinctive response. But blinking, closing our eyes because of something, that is an instinctive response. And if it happens, it gets mentioned because the reader needs to know it. I mean, think about it. If we don't know why our protagonist does things. When I say we, I mean the reader. If the reader doesn't know why our protagonist does things, 
exactly the way they do, will we truly understand why they do things? Of course not. So, number three, analysis. What just happened? And is it worthy of our attention? Is it worth reacting to? If it's not, well, we don't include it. You're walking down the street, your protagonist is walking down the street going to get into the car, a bird flies right in front of him. Oh, he backs up. And then he goes on because it wasn't worthy of follow-up. And if it's not, we don't include it in the story because all it does is verbose. Okay? It slows the narrative. So, analysis, what just happened and worth it reacting to. It's important because now we understand why the protagonist is about to do something. Okay? Step number four, problem solving. This is a critical step because this is where we truly bring the reader on board. Okay. So, we go into what are our options, okay? Um, something's coming towards us, we don't trust them. Our options, we could run away, we could show bravado, we could take almost any action that we think is successful. So we have to decide what to do. And here's the trick, your protagonist will be making decisions, but the reader will be making the same decisions. So if we discuss all the things that that character might do, it should include all of the things that the reader might suggest. Okay, that's important. Because while we do that, and the, the protagonist makes their decision, the reader is saying, oh yeah, he's right. Yeah, I guess, I guess my idea is wrong. And that's, that is critically important because you are now calibrating your reader's perceptions to those of the protagonist. You're also giving all the things that he's taking into or she is taking into account. Okay? And that lets you slip data in that might not otherwise go in. It's one of the ways that we place things... Uh, into the story almost without the reader noticing. Okay, I'll get into more into that. As a matter of fact, I have a demonstration of that a little bit. But that's important because it places the reader and the protagonist in lockstep. Okay, so we notice it, we react to it, we analyze it, we plan, and we do. That could take a millisecond. It could take four hours. Okay? And there are some steps we might leave out. Obviously, if someone throws something at you and you duck, we don't have to decide what to do. So steps one and two are all that we need in a case like that. And then we act. Right? So the analysis is left out. We sometimes leave, or often we'll leave out the instinctive response. But we have to take it into account, because the reader will. And the reader is king. The reader is our customer, and you know the customer is always right. So we must please the reader, not ourselves. Okay? So, we get to number five, we take the action based on step four, and then we repeat again. And what usually happens is this. The protagonist notices Someone coming towards him. He decides to call out to them. They respond. Now we start over again. Analysis, decision making, and this goes on in unbroken chain all day long. The minute you stop your story, step on the stage as the author, and tell the reader anything, you have just killed all semblance of reality. You have stopped the scene clock. You've just gotten yourself a rejection. There's a, there's a really good movie that represents or that, 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 that demonstrates this. It's called Stranger Than Fiction. Go over to YouTube and look that up and watch the trailer. It's a film that only a writer can truly appreciate. In it, 
our protagonist, who is a uh, a an agent of the uh, tax the, the income tax agent, um, begins to hear a voice talking to them, and it turns out that his life is being written by a famous novelist, and he can hear her talking about him, which is exactly what is would happen. I mean, obviously, if you're telling the story and you stop and say this and that, and we're in this guy's bedroom, he's going to turn to you and say, who are you? Why are you in my bedroom? And who are you talking to? And if he doesn't do that, if he stops what he's doing and just stands there tapping his feet, waiting until you're done with your exposition and your little lecture on whatever you chose to talk about, how real can it be if he is accommodating you? Obviously, he must be aware of you because he stopped. Okay, so take a look at that trailer for that movie, and I believe it's on Netflix. It was last time I looked. It's a fun film. As a reader, it's a fun film. So, let's go to the next step. Okay, this is an excerpt from uh, my story, uh, Ghost Girl. And in it, our protagonist, whose name is Tug, goes into a neighbor, he's invited into a neighbor's apartment, and when he comes into the kitchen, he's expecting to see the lady who he followed into the kitchen, but there directly in front of him is a striking woman. And so look at what happens as he perceives it. He, he sees her, he stops, he almost slops his coffee, and I believe, yeah, here we go, he puts it on the countertop. Since his surprise was too obvious to counter, he continued into the kitchen, placed his cup on the countertop, and said, forgive my reaction, I expected to see Mr. Scales, so... So at that point, Instinctive reaction. He stopped and almost spilled the cup, cup. Deliberately then, his response is to put the cup on the countertop and to apologize for the way he appeared. That is her motivation to say or to do. She shrugged, her smile perfunctory, as she said, I'm used to being unexpected. I'm Neely, Neely Clarkson. And before you ask, no, it's not a nickname. I'm named after my grandfather, Neil, whose name means champion. Okay, so this lady's obviously challenging him. And so this then is his motivation. Obviously, the lady was challenging him. But he had the perfect response to her challenge in, her, in his own name. So he said, I'm pleased to meet you, Madam Champion. He gave a small flourish of the hands and added, I'm perfect. So that's his reaction. We go to the next page. And that motivates her. Her mouth opened wordlessly for a moment before she frowned. Perfect, I don't. She gave a little head shake. The lady, now, I stop here because at this point, I am now back to Tug's viewpoint. She said it. He's reacting. It's in the same paragraph because it's a continuation of this. That's, that's an authorial choice. You might start a new paragraph there. Okay. So his, his reaction. This lady had obviously been on the receiving end of many male reactions to her appearance and had decided to use a take-no-prisoners approach to such meeting. Through the luck of his name, though, he bypassed that. So we just learned. That's his thought. He came up with this. Now, I call it an indirect thought because you notice there's no italics. He didn't think it. But it's his reaction. It's his mental reaction to it. So it's sort of an indirect thought. Okay. So he's now, now he's reasoned through, and now we go to the action. 
With a smile to show friendly intent, he said, Hi, Neely, I'm Tug, which isn't a nickname either. My great-grandfather was Mongolian, and... And it means perfect. Her smile turned real. I'm a champion, and you're perfect. I happen to think that's a cute little bit to get them started, and they do end up together. But you can see motivation response, and it's the same sequence over and over. At no time does the author step on stage to tell the reader anything, yet they learn everything. And to take that one step farther, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more on that if I can find out where I am. Aha, uh -huh, there we are. Okay. This is a different story. This is from uh, Breaking the Pattern. And in it, our protagonist is a lady who, I don't know if you've ever heard, heard the rumor, it's not a true story, that Willie Nelson, I think it was, they, they tell it about him. He had a, a, a thing with his wife. And the story is that one day when he was asleep, after treating her badly, she sewed him to the bed and hit him over the head or beat him with a baseball bat. It's not true, but it's a cool story. And I met a lady who claimed that based on that story, she did that to an abusive husband. And that generated this particular story. But in this, Linda, our uh, protagonist, has had this thing with her husband. She's left. He's still alive, but and he will appear later in the novel. But anyway, um, she has gone to Alabama. She was from the South, and she went to Alabama, to uh, Montgomery, I believe it was. And uh, she now is taking a job in a dressmaking factory. It's set in the 80s when all the New York dressmaking factories were moving down South. So she's taking a dress there, or taking a job sewing. She's fairly new to the job. But as this little sequence begins, she is confronted by the foreman, who is the kind of guy who makes a play for every single woman to get her into his office after the hours are over. So we start, she's been told that he's coming. She's, he's mentioned that it looks like uh, her blouse is made of some of the material from the factory, and this is the gimmick of this particular story. She becomes a, she sews very well, and she becomes a designer. But at this point, she is making clothes out of discarded material from the factory. So, he says, I guess I'll have to check on the truth of that with real close look, so I don't have to report you to the company. Like after work tonight, we could have a beer at Kelly's place. So, this is her motivation. This guy has put the make on her. So first thing we have, instinctive response. Closing her eyes and stopping the machine, she mentally shook her head. Okay, now here is where I stuff in a bunch of information and do it as her reviewing the situation rather than me stepping on stage and saying, Hey, here's what you need to know. So, her thought continued. The man simply wouldn't take no for an answer. He was married. He was fat. Of more importance, he was a fool. Rumor had it that he propositioned every woman he met and would use any method he could to get the women under his control into the office after the plant closed. That he was willing to take her to a bar was probably a compliment, though not one that mattered. So she shrugged and went back to sewing, there's her response, with a comment of, sorry, I appreciate the offer though. Okay? So there, right in there, as an indirect thought, the things that she is taking into account is not being told by the narrator. Again, no narrator on the stage. And that is important, and that's how you get it in. And the trick is, anything you want to get in that you feel is necessary, that's how you get in. You give them a reason to think about it. Does that make sense? So that's motivation response units. But motivation reaction units. I call them response unit because, because I'm me. 
you know, and I don't do anything that I, the way anybody else does. Uh, ever, other people write about werewolves, I write about were mermaids, so I am a little bit off on that in that area. But be that as it may, let's go on to fact based as against emotion based. Now this is something else. If you looked at my other uh, my other videos, that you'll you have seen me mention. Reports are fact based. This happened. That happened. They provide an an informational experience. So this is fact based writing. John was sitting on the couch when a bullet came through the glass, narrowly missing his head. This was the third attempt on his life in the past week. He threw himself to the floor and crawled toward the hall and safety. Once there, he pulled his pistol from its holster and went in search of his attacker. This is what I see over and over again. This is the approach we learned in school. It is the approach that most people, when they turn to fiction, will use. But it's fact-based. Let's take that same scene and convert it to emotion-based. The window by John's head exploded into shards, sending him diving to the floor. Bang! It has his attention. Instinctive response. Again? Three times you try to kill me? His still instinctive response, a thought. But I didn't have to tell the reader that three times were they tried to kill him. He takes it into account. So now you know it without anybody telling you. Okay, Deciding that the man had persistence but lousy aim, John hurried to the hall, wincing as the shattered glass cut his knees and palms. Okay, I don't have to tell you he's crawling, otherwise his knees wouldn't get uh, cut by the, uh, by the glass. Okay, so I can leave out the specific mentions, I can add it, I call it as enrichment to a necessary line. But he's doing what you would do. He's getting out of the line of fire, but he's deciding to do it. Okay, so coming to his feet, he pulled Beatrice from her holster and headed for the back door, releasing the safety. Okay, he calls his gun Beatrice. So, you know, he's the old-fashioned, hard-boiled detective. Okay, and that is character development. We know the kind of person he is who would call his gun by a name. If you remember, if you've watched the film or the series Firefly, Jane was that kind of a person. And as soon as he called his guns by, by various names, you knew that. Okay, and so here it is. So... When he gets, releases the safety, the thought, okay, you bastard, you finally have me angry. No more turn the other cheek from me. Okay? Emotion-based. He's pissed. I didn't tell you that. It's obvious from what he said. See the difference? Fact-based. Fact-based versus, versus emotion-based. Emotion-based will always win the reader. Okay. But something else worth mentioning. This is, an, this is an odd one. I've been talking about MRUs. I've been talking about emotion base. There is another approach to telling a story. And it does have the author on stage telling the story. I'm sure there's more than one. But The Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle hit me over the head and made me question everything that I had learned up to that point until I realized the trick that he was playing. It's a very unusual story in that he is 100% on stage talking to the reader. And theoretically, that shouldn't work. It shouldn't involve the reader. Let me, let me read it to you, and I'll, and I'll show you why it works. One day, it happened that two men with long bows rode through her forest hunting for deer. The unicorn followed them, moving so warily that not even the horses knew she was near. The sight of the men filled her with an old 
slow, strange mixture of tenderness and terror. She never let one see her if she could help it, but she liked to watch them ride by and hear them talking. Okay, the trick he uses is that everything he says raises a question or an interest in the reader's mind. And that's a substitute for motivation response. Look, one day it happened that two men with long bows rode through her forest hunting for deer. Okay, well that's interesting. It's a setup. The unicorn followed them, moving so warily that not even the horses knew she was there. Why did she follow them? Hmm, I'd like to know that. Yet, why doesn't she want them to know she's there? Well, that's the first question. The sight of the men filled her with an old, slow, strange mixture of tenderness and terror. Why? Tenderness and terror, that's interesting. She must like humans, perhaps, or fear them because of the thing. They will hunt her. But she obviously must in some way understand them. Ah. And finally, she never let one see her if she could help it, but she liked to watch them ride by and hear them talking. Well, she must understand them. If she just hear them making noise, that's like barking. I mean, if she didn't understand it. So why did she want to do that? You see my point? He's telling the story, but he is generating reader interest by constantly making the reader want to ask him a question. And there's a trick to it that goes with it. He answers the question often in the next line, while raising a new question. So you feel like you're in conversation with Peter Beagle. And that is a, a fantastic approach. It's not, one I've, well, it's not one I've tried to master, but it works. Any approach that, that pleases the reader will work. But the point is, every approach must pique the reader's interest must give them a reason to want to know more, to feel involved. That's critical. Okay? So, move on to was, 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 was. Okay. There was laughter in his voice as he pointed and said, you've seen that a million times. He was wearing a smile, one that wavered a bit when he noticed that she, or whatever, he left a message in case there was someone living with him. And I've outlined all of those things because you'll hear people tell you, hey, don't, don't use words like was in your, in your writing. Why? Let's put up an alternate to that. Instead of there was laughter in his voice, laughter warmed his voice as he pointed and said. The difference is this is the author talking to the reader and telling them there was laughter, this was him laughing. She was wearing a smile. Okay, here. Her smile wavered a bit when she it just chops out a bunch of crap that's not necessary. It gets the author off the stage. And when you say her smile wavered a bit, it tells you exactly what it is. So, which is important. He left a message in case there was someone living with him, or he left a message in case someone lived with him. Bang, we cut it out. Each one of those things not only takes it from the author into the character's viewpoint, it makes it shorter. It reads faster, more impact. The faster your story gets read, the more impact it has. Okay, that's was, 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 was. And now, Filter words. Well, I guess I have to turn off that. Okay. Filter words. Heard. Knew. Felt. Well, there's another was. She heard the floor creak as he changed position. Can you get any more distance from the reader? You're talking to them. But in this, the floor creaked as he changed position. That's her hearing it and perhaps reacting to it, at least having a, some, it, it, it's a bit of scene setting. 
okay? He knew her body, she knew her body wasn't one to be ashamed of, but, but again, that's distancing, that's a filter word. Uh, some people call them crutch words. But without it, certainly her body wasn't one to be ashamed of, but, but she has made that decision. And finally, after an hour's worth of talk, she was tired but felt more at ease than she had in months. Well, who cares whether it's months or weeks or days or years? She feels more at ease. That's what matters. So we change it to, after an hour's worth of talk, she was tired but far more at ease. Okay, filter words are a pain in the butt. They distance you from the reader and they make it all from you to the reader rather than placing the reader into the story. Okay, and there's one more. Verbose. Oh Lord, this is probably one I see every time. He left, but not before getting her to agree to go dancing with him on Friday evening. Who else would she, who else would he convince her to go dancing with? Right? He, he convinced her to go dancing with all his friends? No. So we shorten it. Look, we take off a whole bunch of words here. He left after she agreed to go dancing on Friday evening. Bang. Says what it has to say, and no more. It's the essence of of the conversation, of the action, not every detail. Remember, we provide the essence of conversation and of action. And as Alfred Hitchcock puts it, drama is life without the dull bits. That's a dull bit. Again, that seemed unlikely. The valley roads were, well, why not just shorten it down to unlikely? The valley roads were, bang. Take out the dull bits. So, I bored you for long enough now. But these are things that I feel very strongly about. And these are the things that are the reason that the rejection rate right now is 99.9 .9 plus. Literally, one in a thousand is accepted, or less. Now, it's hard to judge because obviously, if you, if you uh, apply to five different agents and they all reject you, that's one story rejected five times, so that kind of skews it. But here's the point. The average publisher, if you ask a publisher or an agent, they'll tell you, 75%, fully three quarters, of what they get as a submission they call unreadable. It's rejected on the first page, often before the end of the first paragraph. Why? Because the author probably doesn't even know that there's another approach from what they were given in school. The nonfiction writing skills were given in school. 75% of the people who are watching this don't know that, and will be rejected after working for months. So some people take a year or two to come out with something, and it works for them because they know what to expect. They know the characters and the backstory before they start reading. And they literally are people who might have a writing career, but who give up because everything they submit was rejected. I wrote six novels that I queried again and again and sent everywhere else. I was pretty sure that I was doing well at the end of those six and that I was like that far from acceptance, that I was a great writer. And then I paid to have someone do a critique of the first three pages. First thousand words, four pages. I was doing everything wrong. I got that envelope back, I opened it up and I expected, hey, you got all kinds of commas screwed up and this needs to be improved, but great idea, Jay. You got a great story idea there. I opened it up and I saw a sea of blue ink. 
literally a sea of it. There were notes between the lines, in the margins, in the top and the bottom margin. When I turned over the first page, there were notes on the back of it. I was stunned. I said, well, maybe, you know, all the comments in the beginning and then second page was as bad, third page was as bad. I just, it was the most emotionally devastating thing that happened to me in my life up till that time. I took that, the manuscript that I'd sent, I slipped it into the envelope and I put it in a drawer and I, for three days, I could not open that drawer. Couldn't bring myself to open that drawer. I was that disturbed by it, but I could not ignore that drawer. It was there in my thoughts 24 hours a day. After three days, I opened it up. And I opened it and I began to read. And I said, let me see what she says. In the first comment, in the story, a woman had come over and I, I had told the reader that she was, uh, her, her nickname was Biddy and that she was uh, the classic uh, Biddy. Um, and I said at one point, the old lady unbent enough to say, and the comment was, oh, why did she bend over? So how could she un unbend if she wasn't bent over? And I just looked and I said, how dumb can this man or this woman be to misunderstand that badly? This time I slammed it back into the envelope and I threw it into the drawer and I slammed the drawer and I walked away. And then I came back the next day and I had an attack of insanity. I said to myself, you know what, look, I know this person is an idiot, but if I wrote that well enough, they shouldn't have been able to stop. So let me look at the remarks that they made and see if I can figure out what in the story allowed them to make that, if I can solve that problem. Then I have something. And by the way, that is the thing about a critique. It's not so much what they say. It's the fact that they were knocked out of the story. Okay. What they say will give you a hint as to why. So anyway, I looked at it, and after reading the first one and thinking about it, I said, oh yeah, she hasn't acted stiffly. So how can she unbend if she's not being stiff and rigid? And... Oh, so then I went to the next one, I went, oh, and I went to the next one, I went, oh, damn. And it turned out I had not a clue how to write. I know none of the things that I've been talking to you in, in any of these videos. I was absolutely lost. I was thinking cinematically in a medium that doesn't, re doesn't reproduce either sound or picture. I was all too often being a storyteller, one whose voice carries no emotion because they don't know how I would, what emotion I would put into it. They wouldn't know what gestures I would use and the body language and, and when I'd go like that for effect before an audience. I was doing everything wrong. And a lot of you were doing the same thing and that's why because of the people who have helped me in the past. And the fact that, yeah, I've been able to sell a few stories, get contracts from, uh, from a few uh, publishers who were dumb enough to say yes. Um, but I am paying forward a Ben Franklin debt of the kind that I've mentioned in other ones, that uh, Ben Franklin once loaned money to a man and said, no, you don't pay me back. You, loan the same amount of money to someone else and tell them that they must loan it to someone else. And I think that's, you know, it's what we call paying forward. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. So I am paying forward. And I really, really hope that what I've said has been of some help to you.
This is the Grumpy Old Writing Coach, hoping that maybe you'll look at one of my books or two. I think they're pretty good. Signing off and wishing you luck.